So Sandy's going to be talking about the hunt for the urban creation age. Right, so the, the talk about uh, the home for inner core mediation age. Um, it's really just a general uh, summary of the subject, and it includes some of the work I did in my PhD, which was basically to provide paleomagnetic constraints for inner core mediation age. And I'm just going to uh, talk about why it's important and some of the factors that affect the age of the inner core the role that paleomagnetism has to play, and then just uh, end on some of the latest paleomagnetic data, which is relevant to the subject. And so, that's weird. Um, yeah, so in inner core mediation age, well, in the, the formation of an inner core is, is a fundamental, it was a fundamental event in a structural and conditional <laughs> evolution. Um, it's, it likely played a major role in the processes and conditions that affected life on Earth, for example, magnetic shielding from solar radiation. And uh, it's also a significant constraint on um, Earth's total energy budget and its cooling history. But it's a complicated problem to solve because it occurred in the ancient past and it's not directly observable in the same way as um, geological features on the surface of the Earth are. Uh, and it's also dependent on uh, a wide range of poorly constrained processes. So it's a major problem for us to solve. Um, and we go about that by uh, various means. We've, the, the, the typical ways are ge um, geodynamo models, core, coupled core mantle models, and uh, statistical paleo intensity analyses. Um, yeah, so as I said, it's dependent on many poorly constrained parameters, um, including major gen the amount of radiogenic heating, uh, the, the chemical composition of the core. Uh, but I'm just concentrating here on um, two of those parameters, which are thermal conductivity, which is this K constant, and the heat flow across the core mantle boundary. And that's because in the last sort of decade or so, um, thermal conductivity in the outer core was actually revised upwards by up to five times. Um, so this higher capacity for this more efficient heat transfer um, leads to faster cooling. <clears throat> and so if you take the current core size and extrapolate it back with this faster cooling rate, then um, it, it produces a much younger inner core age. Uh, but it also means that we, have, we must have had hotter initial conditions in the earth. And so um, this leads to a problem because uh, if you have this um, conduction along the adiabatic gradient in the outer core um, equal or greater than the amount of heat flow across the uh, core mantle boundary, then it inhibits thermal conductivity and therefore um, the geodynamo. And, and that's what this figure is shown where we've got on the right, uh, a super adiabatic regime in the in the uh, the liquid core. So uh, you know the heat flow there is greater across the core mantle boundary than it is uh, being conducted along the adiabat. So hot material is able to cool when it reaches the uh, top of the outer core and and therefore sink and drive this thermal convection, which drives the geodynamo. Uh, whereas on the left part of the figure, we've got this subadiabatic regime where hot material gets trapped at the top of the outer core because it's not getting extracted fast enough through the core mantle boundary. And it, this can lead to a thermally stratified layer uh, and it, that inhibits uh, thermal convection. So I know what's going on with these uh, slides, but <laughs> I didn't make them like that. <laughs> so it leads to the problem of um, how did we get a, geo, uh, a geomagnetic field for billions of years prior to an inner core with these high thermal conductivity values? Well, one way was is to increase uh, the heat flow across the core mantle boundary. Uh, that also produces a younger inner core age, but that in itself is uh, limited by how fast the mantle can extract heat as well. And uh, the current research, I think, suggests that uh, the actual scenario is, is one of both of these uh, uh, scenarios where you've got a super adiabatic regime with um, heterogeneous, heterogeneous 
thermally, um, thermal chemical stratification in parts. Um, so if we look at the, uh, this is a figure of all of the sort of age estimates over the last sort of 12 to 13 years for intercornucleation age. Um, and you can see from the key that there's quite a few different methods to produce age estimates. Um, and yeah, so firstly, like I just suggested there, that, that as you increase thermal conductivity and heat flow across the core metal boundary, that produces a, a younger inner core age. And we can see those from the, um, where the arrows indicate those. And you can also see from the plot that we've got a mean, you know, if you take all those and, and estimate a mean age, you get 670 million years plus or minus uh, 300. So, you know, while it, it does look like, you know, they're all sort of within one st standard deviation of that age, but the, it, the, the age estimates actually span more than a billion years. So it's, it's not resolved. And um, I think, you know, robust models today should really be constrained by paleomagnetic data. And, uh, and that's because paleomagnetism is intrinsically linked to and informs on the state of the geodynamo. So for intercorniciation, um, which produces new power sources for the geodynamo, we would expect to see a signal, but it's not clear what type of signal we, we would see. And there's some reasons for this. For example, number one is that a regime change from a top-down thermally driven power source to a bottom-up chemically driven power source uh, would suppress, it may suppress uh, intensity increases at the surface because the power source has dropped down by 3,000 kilometers into the earth. So uh, and another reason is that um, an increase, the increase in power that we get may transfer to higher order fields rather than dipole field. And an example of this is the Ediacaran, uh, where and we can see in this uh, figure by Talner et al, Dan's figure, is that we've got these really weak uh, dipole moments throughout the Ediacaran and discrepant directions. And it's often associated with intercore nucleation. Uh, and it's thought to be a weak power state prior to in a corniculation because of a depleted thermal convection. But it could just be the opposite of that because uh, in many models, when you increase the Rayleigh number in the outer core or the vigor, which we would expect from these new power sources, the, uh, the dipole moment actually decreases and it actually resembles a sort of multipolar Ediacan field. So we really don't know whether this type of behavior is uh, due to a weakened geodynamo prior to intercornucleation, or actually it's the effect of uh, the additional power after intercornucleation. So I think the message there is that we, we should still be cautious and, uh, and unbiased in, in terms of this, this data. And I don't know if you can see at the bottom there, no, and another reason is that, you know, we, we've got, we've likely got variations on mantle time scales and they could actually mask a signal from intercornucleation. So, uh, and I will come back to that uh, point. Uh, so now I'll just uh, talk about a few studies we did during my PhD. So these two papers we did um, to try and constrain intercore nucleation age, uh, we actually targeted the neoprogenozoic because that was a prime target and there was literally no data at all in like 500 million years. And the, the colored markers in this plot are the data from those papers. And I'm not gonna talk about it too much, but essentially the, the message from those two papers is that we really need, you can see that there's a, actually, um, they don't agree with any kind of trend. And the message we ultimately got from the second paper was that we need to be cautious when we're trying to infer something from really sparse or isolated data because it, um, these can mask a huge amount of variation in the field. We just don't we, we don't really know what's happening because yeah we compared this type of uh, variation that we saw there to the Phanerozoic, which has high variation, and it was pretty much the same. Um, and then we did a third paper last year 
which I'll talk a bit more about because it's quite interesting because um, I'm going to compare it to another paper by Zawatal. Um, because these two papers actually, they came out within a week of each other. And they're both pain intensity papers. And we happen to study rocks of an almost identical age, but we've got quite different results and interpretations. Um, so if we look at those two papers, so Zawatal was a single crystal study, um, whereas our paper was a hell rock study, multiple technique study. And, and if we just look at the comparison of results, we can see Zawatal's in green, our, our data, our results are in pink. And so, yeah, ours were much weaker. Um, so Zawatal's key points from the paper were that the, this single new datum that they got uh, they were able to constrain in the to 550 million years. Whereas our, uh, our key points were that, yeah, our data is really weak and it, uh, just as weak as the Ediacaran. But our data also fits with this, with a long-term trend in dipole moments, which I'll, I'll, I'll talk about next. Um, but ultimately we said we can't really robustly infer anything new about either of these subjects from a single data point. Um, there's a comparison of selection criteria there as well, um, where basically um, these single crystal studies uh, seem to require a much more relaxed selection criteria. Um, but that's a bit to say, but they don't use curvature, which is, I think, it's quite an important uh, criterion to use. Um, so, yeah, I mentioned these long term trends in. In, uh, in dipole moments. So this, this figure, uh, I'll just explain what it is. So we've got uh, uh, paleo intensity data is in the bottom whisker in the dark blue, and that is uh, binned according to this, um, this other most simplified uh, record of reversal frequencies, which is adapted by Galen et al. 2019. And so they both fit on the same axis on the y axis. We've got reversal frequencies and we've got dipole moments. And so the reversal frequencies, we've got normal uh, in green. We've got these hyperactivity periods in peach and the what we call non, -unifer non uniformitarian periods in blue. And then we've got uh, the three phanerozoic uh, supercrons with this uh, thin gray bar at the bottom. And what I hope you can see is that um, preceding these supercrons by 50 to 100 million years, we've got these really weak periods of uh, dipole moments, and they correspond to uh, periods of hyperactive reversal frequencies. And similarly, when we do have supercrons, we tend to get much uh, stronger dipole moments. So there's a sort of a persistent negative correlation throughout the phanerozoic between reversal rates and dipole moments. Um, and of course, you know, it's, it's, it's not absolutely robust. Uh, there's periods, for example, where we don't really know what the reversal uh, frequencies are, where, which we've indicated with question marks. And there's periods there where our data sits uh, about 530 million years where there really is almost no uh, paleo intensity data. So we've got like six paleo intensity data for, for like 100 million years there, which is a really key time, it turns out. So um, we could say that a weak dipole moment would be expected during these hyperactivity periods, which is what our data show. And that also begs the question for me that, you know, uh, the single crystal data was uh, reported to cool over half a million years. Would, if that's during a hyperactive reversal frequency period, then 10, 10 reversals have gone on in that time. So what is this time average paleomagnetic dipole moment actually recording? And I actually think that's quite an interesting point. Um, and yeah, so I think, as I said before, you know, a signal for inner nucleation age really needs to be robustly isolated from these long-term trends, i.e. we need many data 
to confidently say something about it. But I do believe that, you know, with some targeted research now in these key time periods, especially this sort of Cambrian uh, time period, may give us some uh, real insight into the initiation age. That's it, thanks. Great, good talk, Sam. Um, is there any questions that are in your mind? Okay. <laughs> yeah. So uh, you show uh, comparison the results. I I read the journal paper. Uh, you know, they are uh, magnetic uh, similar to that. You know, needles, you know, perfect uh, magnetic carrier. So, what's your thoughts? Uh, could be the origin of these types. Um, it could be, I mean, you can see from, you know, you can see from this figure, they've got quite a bit of uncertainty in there. So it might be that single crystals for these tend to produce higher estimates. Um, it could be, you know, it might be an isotropy, it might be a polymer correction. I don't know, it might be the relaxed selection criteria that they use. You know, it's hard to say really. But uh, I think our study was fairly robust. Given that you never see the raw data, it's very hard to assess that. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Thank you very much. Um, any other questions? Okay. Guys, yeah. Thanks, everyone.